Okay, welcome back. Uh, I guess you've seen your first homework already up on Moodle, and you have one week to complete it. It's due next uh, Monday. So last time we were discussing sigma algebras, generated sigma algebras, Borel sigma algebras, and so on. And the main message, one of the main messages about sigma algebras was that sigma algebras are huge, they're complicated, and we don't have a special explicit form for an arbitrary event in a sigma algebra. This is what is happening in general, especially when we have uh, infinitely uh, many sets in a sigma algebra. So, for instance, we discussed the Borel sigma algebra, which is the sigma algebra generated by intervals of this form or of any other form. And this includes, so this is a huge sigma algebra. It includes all intervals, all singletons, their countable unions and intersections, their complements, the countable unions of those, meaning that the countable unions of those countable intersections and unions, and so on and so forth. So if we sit down and try to write down a Borel set, a set in the sigma algebra, we cannot find a unique way of doing it. But if we come up with a subset of R that we can write down on a piece of paper explicitly, this is always a Borel set, if you use countably many set operations. So our aim today is to simplify sigma algebras a bit, not too much, but just a bit. And this is going to be through the monotone class theorem. So this is our second section of our first chapter, probability spaces. And our aim is to simplify sigma algebras, OK? So for this reason, we're going to introduce a term called a Dinkin system or a lambda system. So again, let omega be a non-empty set and D a collection of subsets of omega. D is called a Dinkin system. or a lambda system on omega if it is just like a sigma algebra contains the full set omega, the sample space omega. It's closed under complements, meaning that a in D implies a complement is in D. And so this is also the same property, the second property of a sigma algebra. So what's going to differ is the last property. Closed under disjoint countable unions. This makes it a weaker structure. So here's what we mean by being closed under disjoint countable unions. 
if A1, A2, etc. in D are disjoint sets, then their union is in this collection, script D. So in this case, we call D a Dinkin system or a lambda system. So which one is weaker? If you have a sigma algebra, is it necessarily a Dinkin system? If you have a Dinkin system, is it necessarily a sigma algebra? Which one works? Yes? If it's a Dinkin system, it's only able to work with disjoint sets. Whereas to be able to satisfy the last property in the definition of a sigma algebra, you need arbitrary sets, countably many arbitrary sets, whose intersections may be non-empty. So it's the other way around. A sigma algebra is a thinking system, the converse fails in general. And the main reason of the failure is that a Dinkin system fails to work with arbitrary sets, with possible intersections. Reason, a Dinkin system cannot handle properly intersections of sets. Everything clear so far? Yes? Do we have a concept of pairwise disjoint or disjoint means pairwise disjoint in this sense? Disjoint sets means take any two of those sets, they are disjoint, pairwise. Okay? So let me let me add it here as an explanation. AI intersection AJ is empty for all IJ that are not equal. Okay. We're, go we're not going to say pairwise explicitly. Okay. This joint always means this. Pick any two different sets, they're disjoint. Their intersection is empty. Okay, thank you for the point. So the Dinkin system fails to deal with intersections, and that's the only thing about it. So why don't we just create a different structure that is just for the purpose of dealing with intersections? Okay, so why don't we define another structure just for the purpose of dealing with intersections. Okay, so there comes the second definition of today. Another structure, like a sigma algebra, like a Dinkin system, so again, we start with a non-empty set. And now script P, a collection of subsets of omega. So script P is called a pi system coming from product, because intersection is like a product, right? If it is closed under finite intersections.
that is if a1 that 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 a n with n being a finite number, if we have sets a1 to a n in P, then their intersection is in P. This is equivalent a b in P implies a intersection b is in P. So if you just say it with only two sets, this is the same thing. By, indac by induction, you can generalize from here to here. They're equivalent statements. If you can do it with two sets, you can do it with finitely many sets. Not countably many, just finitely many. Okay. So we have Dinkin system and Pi system. Seems like they complement each other, right? One works with disjoint sets, the other works with intersections. So the intuition is that we should hope if we bring the two structures together, they will form a sigma algebra. So this is Dinkin's Pi lambda theorem. Let me state it as a proposition. So let, again, omega be an unempty set. And f a collection of subsets of omega. So f is a sigma algebra. If and only if it is a pi system and a lambda system, or Dinkin system. So this is in informal language written as sigma equals pi plus lambda. In quotations, this has no meaning mathematically. Okay. So it's a very intuitive result, given the way we define those objects. Okay, So there remains to prove it. Okay, So let's prove it. Is the statement clear, first of all? OK. So proof. Let's start with the easy part. Suppose f is a sigma algebra, then it is clearly a Dinkin system. We just said this. Because there is only a minor difference in the definitions, and it is this part, this jointness. So is a sigma algebra also a pi system? Why? Finite intersections, which we proved last time. It is also a pi system, as shown last time. It's closed under finite intersections. That was one of the uh, basic properties of sigma algebras that we showed last time. Okay, so let's check the converse. Conversely, suppose f is a pi system and a lambda system or Dinkin system. And we have to show that it's a sigma algebra. Well, what's the definition of sigma algebra? Just very similar to the definition of Dinkin system. And indeed, number one, number two are the same. This is already satisfied because it's a Dinkin system. This is al already satisfied because it's a Dinkin system. So it remains to prove the last property in the definition of sigma algebra. Okay, To show 
f is a sigma algebra, we only need to check it is closed under countable unions. So let's do it to that end. Let a1, a2, etc., be in F. And we're going to show their union is also in F. But we only know that F is a Dinkin system and the pi system. So we're going to use these two facts to show that the union of those not necessarily disjoint sets is a set in F. Well, we have the Dinkin system property, this last property. If we can somehow come up with disjoint sets, then our job would be easier, right? We have not necessarily disjoint sets, so let's create disjoint sets out of them. Let's say you have A1, A2, A3. I'm not going to draw the rest. It's going to get complicated. Let me put dot, dot, dot here. So how can we create disjoint sets like B1, B2, B3, et cetera? Any ideas? Yes? We can start by so start with somewhere. Well, why not one, right? So set B1, which is A1. So this is my B1, OK? Now, when you're creating B2, be careful. Just add the new stuff coming from A2. The new stuff is here. This is the new stuff. I don't care about A3 now, OK? So this is my new stuff, B2. A2 minus A1. Now my new stuff coming from A3 is this part. So it is A3, but not the parts in A1 and A2, and so on. It is just a n plus 1 minus a1 to a n union, and so on. First of all, why are they in f? OK? Why are they in f? Well, b1 is a1. It's in f. B2 is A2 minus A1, which is A2 intersection A1 complement. OK. A1 is an F. A1 complement is an F because it's a Dinkin system. This is an F. So the intersection of these two sets must be an F because it is a Pi system, intersection. Therefore, this is an F. Let me do it for Bn plus 1 as well, the general case. So this is just An plus 1 intersection, A1 complement. So I'm going to complement this thing. So it is A1 complement, A2 complement, An complement. So each is an F by the Dinkin system property. And the whole thing is a finite intersection. So by the property of the pi system, it's an F. OK? They are sets in F that are disjoint. So observe B1, B2, et cetera, are disjoint. So by three of the definition of Dinkin system, their union is an F. 
But are we done? This is union of PIs. I want union of AIs. So how can I conclude my proof? Union of BIs. What's the union of B1, B2, B3? What's, B, what's the union of B1, B2, B3? Same as A1, A2, A3. Same is true for the whole union. You're just writing it in a different way. You still have the same sets, same material. All you're using is the sets A1, A2, and so on when you're defining B1, B2, and so on. So these unions are the same. Therefore, F is a sigma algebra. Done. So that is the Dinkins pi lambda theorem. Which one? Over there? Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah, that's a finite intersection, right? We stop here. There are 1, 2, etc., and n plus 1 terms in this intersection. So we can use the pi system property. Okay. So that's a famous result. Sigma equals pi plus lambda in quotations. So can you give me an example of a pi system that we have seen last time? Can you give me an example of a pi system? A collection of sets that is much simpler than a sigma algebra that you can define explicitly. You can tell me the form of a set in this pi system. It's even on the board now. What is an example of a pi system on this board? This, but, 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 but this is definition. Uh, you mean you can have A, B, and A intersection B? Is that what you mean? Um, I'm just looking for a very concrete example. No, only A intersection B is in a pi system. Ah, OK. By itself, yeah, it's a, it's a pi system. Yeah. But, but any other example? Is this collection, forget the sigma, is this collection a pi system? Who thinks yes? All you're going to check is that this property is satisfied. Take two intervals, open intervals. Is the intersection of two open intervals again an open interval? Well, possibly empty, but if it's not empty, it's again an open interval. All you're doing is that. So here's an example. So this A1, last time we called it A1, is a pi system. Just you can see it on a picture if you have A1, B1, and A2, B2, well, the intersection is A2, B1. So it's a, it's a pi system. You can, you can just check it. The, the, you can also have pictures like this, right? A1, B1, A2, B2. Then you get an empty set, which is fine, which is fine. Because here we say, if you have an interval like 1 to minus 1, we consider this as an empty set. And this is also an interval by convention. Okay? You can also have a picture like this, A1, B1. One covers the other. And in this case, the intersection is this. Here, the intersection is empty. So this is a pi system. So pi system 
is much simpler than a sigma algebra. This pi system is much simpler than the Borel sigma algebra, for instance. So the idea is the following. When proving a statement about the Borel sigma algebra, can we reduce, in some sense, the proof to a statement about A1. In other words, let's say I give you a homework problem, show this and that for every set in the Borel sigma algebra, and can you find a way to reduce the proof down to a simpler proof about sets in the pi system. And then somehow you're going to conclude, well, I showed this for the sets in the pi system. Now, using the theorem that we're going to prove now, the monotone class theorem, I can say that this statement also holds for all sets in the Borel sigma algebra. So this is going to be a magical tool for us. Okay, the monotone class theorem. It's a very powerful tool. We're going to use it over and over again during this course, in the homeworks, in the lectures, everywhere. And if you continue your education on probability and stochastic processes, you may see a lot of more places to where you can just use this monotone class theorem and the proof becomes very simple. So here's the statement. Let omega be a non-empty set. Let pi be a pi system and D, a Dinkin system on omega, then here's the statement. If this collection, P, is a subcollection of D, namely that every set in P is also a set in D, then D also covers all the sets in the sigma algebra generated by P. Okay? This is what we're going to prove. So, how can we use it? Here's a remark. Suppose you want to prove a statement for every set in sigma of P, the sigma algebra. That's a recipe, OK? Follow this recipe. Of course, if it works. Show the statement for every set in P, which is hopefully an easier task, because that's a pi system. So perhaps you're going to have intervals or simpler sets than the ones in a sigma algebra. Okay. Next, show that the collection of all sets satisfying this property 
is a Dinkin system. This, this is going to form this D. Let me say a Dinkin system D, OK? Now, so P is a subcollection of D. Use the theorem to conclude sigma P is a subset of D. So the statement holds for every set in sigma P. How to use monotone class theorem in a difficult proof. OK. Any questions about the statement of monotone class theorem? That's a very important theorem. Okay? And it's also a little bit difficult to digest. Okay? You're going to hopefully understand it better and better as you use it in proofs. Okay? So don't expect to just digest it at once, but look at it over and over again as we move forward in the course and try to see how to use it in action, OK? There are going to be cases where you're going to use it in action, OK? So now, before proving this theorem, we're going to do it, I'd like to restate it, which is going to make the proof simpler. So equivalent formulation. equivalent formulation of the monotone class theorem. First of all, here's a remark. An arbitrary intersection of sigma algebras is a sigma algebra. So this we showed last time. Remember, when we are defining the sigma algebra generated by a collection, we talked about sigma algebras containing that collection. And the intersection of all those sigma algebras is, again, a sigma algebra. The same is true for Dinkin systems and pi systems. So just replace this with Dinkin system. The same result holds. You can check it as an exercise. The same holds true for pi systems. So give me arbitrarily many Dinkin systems. Their intersection is a Dinkin system. The same thing as in sigma algebras, OK? Easy to believe, but you can just prove it on your own. Let me say exercise. But anyway, what's the purpose of saying this? Well, if we have arbitrary, the intersection of arbitrarily many sigma algebras is a sigma algebra, then we said the intersection of sigma algebras containing a collection is, again, a sigma algebra. And this is the smallest sigma algebra containing it. So that's how we define sigma of a collection A. So this means we can also talk about the lambda the Dinkin system generated by a collection, the pi system generated by a collection. So we can talk about sigma A, so, so given a collection A of subsets of omega, we can talk about sigma A smallest sigma algebra generated by 
uh, sorry, smallest sigma algebra containing A. We can talk about lambda A, smallest thinking system containing A. And you can talk about pi A, the smallest pi system containing A. So when we say lambda A, that's the smallest thinking system containing A. Okay? And it is well defined, just like the uh, smallest sigma algebra is well defined. So in particular, if D is a thinking system A is in D implies lambda A is in D, is a subset of D. Recall our lemma, recall similar lemma for sigma algebras. Okay, so you have a collection A and it is contained in a thinking system. Well, of course, it contains, this thinking system must contain the smallest thinking system containing A. That's the analogous statement that we had for sigma algebras. Okay. Well, now the reformulation. Okay, so so this is the end of the remark. Okay, so suppose the theorem holds true. Okay. Suppose we believe in this theorem. We haven't proved this yet, but let's say this is true. Well, I have a pi system and a Dinkin system containing the pi system. As a special case, I can take D to be what? To be the Dinkin system generated by P. Let's take D equals lambda P as a special case. Since, of course, P is a subcollection of lambda P. Lambda P is the Dinkin system generated by P. So by the theorem, let's use the implication of the theorem. By theorem, we get what? I'm just using what it says. Sigma p is a subset of lambda p. This is what the theorem tells me, the second part. right? So all we did is to replace this t with lambda p, which satisfies this condition. But on the other hand, Lambda p is a subset of sigma p. Why? I'm going to ask you why now. So why do we have that lambda p is a subset of sigma p? Just think, think, think in terms of this remark. Why do we have lambda p is a subset of sigma p? What, what can we say about the sig sigma p? This is a sigma algebra, so it is also what? It's also a Dinkin system. So it's, it's a Dinkin system containing P, right? Let me put a star here, and I'm going to say by star. Every sigma algebra is a Dinkin system. And in particular, the sigma P is a one that contains P, therefore, it is bigger, it is a larger collection than the smallest 
Vinkian system containing P. So these two, so we get lambda P equals sigma P. Let's put it in a box and give it a name. Let's say double star. Now my claim is that this is just the same as the statement of the theorem. Okay, so I should also prove the converse. Suppose, conversely, that lambda uh, or, or this uh, double star holds. Holds. Let D be a Dinkin system containing P. This is what we are saying. Okay? This is what we are saying because this is what we have to assume to prove this theorem starting from double star. So this implies lambda p is a subset of d by the single star, right? d is a Dinkin system containing p. Therefore, d is also a larger system than the Dinkin system generated by p. But my double star tells me that this is just sigma p. But by double star, sigma p equals lambda p, and it is a subset of d. And this is what the theorem says. So the claim of theorem holds. Therefore, the theorem is equivalent to double star, this equation in the box. So why did I want to work with this simplification? Well, seemingly simplification. They are equivalent statements, right? So, so this is equivalent to what the theorem says. But the beauty of this is that it doesn't have a reference to an additional, an external Dinkin system D. So there you have a pi system and an external Dinkin system. Here you don't have that. You just start with a pi system and that's it. So this, this is saying that, this is saying that the lambda system or the Dinkin system and the sigma algebra generated by a pi system coincide. If you'd like to say it in words, the Dinkin system and the sigma algebra generated by a pi system coincide. So we have to prove this equality now. So <laughs> proof of double star, which is also the proof of monotone class theorem. Any questions so far? So let's prove lambda p equals sigma p. We'd like to prove an equality. So we have to prove both sides. Let's prove this side first. Lambda p is a subset of sigma p follows from the fact that sigma p is a Dinkin system containing p. Well, exactly here, this uh, single star. So, so there is nothing to prove about it. There is nothing to prove about it. This is the smallest thinking system containing P. 
And this is a Dinkin system containing P. OK? Now the other side. So to prove sigma P is a subset of lambda P, it is sufficient to prove that lambda P is a sigma algebra. Because then, we have already uh, this, which implies this. So if we prove that lambda p is a sigma algebra, this means it's a sigma algebra containing p. Therefore, it is larger than the sigma algebra generated by p. OK? So to prove lambda p is a sigma algebra, remember sigma equals pi plus lambda. And this is already a lambda as a Dinkin system by the sigma equals pi plus lambda theorem, we, it is sufficient to prove that lambda pi, lambda p, is a pi system. And that's what we're going to prove in the second hour in 10 minutes. Okay.